Good Wednesday morning. Here's the good text. This is a great text, okay? I'm going to read it to you. This is great. The guy who wrote this thing could write, okay? <laughs> Divinely inspired, but the guy, the guy's a writer, okay? God always writes. God's word always comes through the human instrument, okay? Not only the storyteller, not only the, the, uh, the let's say the content of the story, but the storyteller himself. Watch this. Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry that God did not carry out the evil he had threatened against Nineveh. They cleaned their act up, okay? He prayed, I beseech you, Lord. Is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled at first uh, to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, rich in clemency, loath to punish. And now, Lord, please take my life from me. For it's better for me to die than to live. He's a really jerk, isn't he? <laughs> He's, he's, he's complaining about the divine mercy. <laughs> Something, man, eh? But the Lord asked him, have you reason to be angry? Jonah then left the city for a place to the east of it, where he built himself a hut and waited under it, uh, and waited under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. Can't wait for the fireworks, okay? And when the Lord God provided a, go a gourd plant that grew up over Jonah's head, giving shade that relieved him, of any discomfort, Jonah was very happy over the plant. What are you kidding me? A free ride. But the next morning at dawn, God sent a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun arose, God sent a burning east wind, and the sun beat upon Jonah's head until he became faint. Then Jonah asked for death. Well, this guy's a clown, okay? I would be better off dead than alive. But God said to Jonah, have you reason to be angry over the plant? I have reason to be angry, Jonah answered. Angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned over a plant which cost you no labor and which you did not even raise it? It came up in one night and in one night it perished. And should I not be concerned over Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who cannot distinguish their right hand from their left, not to mention the many cattle? What's the matter? Shouldn't I care? You see? Are you worried about a plant? Did you even plant it? Hmm? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? See? You know, I actually, there was a guy, and I told this story before, I'm probably dead, I don't know. There was a guy in the parish who was kind of, he wasn't notoriously bad, but he was a kind of a tough critter. And I remember, I told you this story. He gave a gift to uh, Junie's grandson, Jake. He gave him a, a camouflage shirt or something out of nowhere, okay? Jake was just a little boy, and, and this was his grandson's shirt, okay, that he, he passed on. He asked me to give it to Jake, something like that. His name was John Marcus, okay? He was kind of a tough South St. South Saint Louis kind of guy. I liked him. He was a rough and tough guy, okay? Smooth, he weren't, okay? He's a working stiff. But I remember him because there were the two things. I think I told this story to you already, that he lived in the cellar of the house in which his divorced wife lived. <laughs> he was, he not only was divorced, he was banished to the cellar. He lived in the cellar. But he thought enough about Jake, who was about, I guess, seven, eight, nine at the time, if that, maybe seven, give him, his grandson's um, camouflage shirt. He knew that Jake liked to go out in the woods with me, okay, stuff like that. And I knew the story about him uh, living in the cellar, okay? Well, when John was dying, excuse me, his wife was dying. When his wife, his ex-wife was dying, John took very, very good care of her, despite the fact she hated him, literally. And then when he was dying, I remember and his daughter asked me to go see him, and I think that's how it worked. Anyway, I knew he was in the hospital dying, so I went and I anointed him and gave him communion. And I, I know I told you the story. His cousin or something was a priest, is a priest, and he was complaining about his, Think of a Jonah. That here at the last, this guy was this bad guy. He was a drinker. He was a bad, a bad husband, bad, bad, bad. He's shooting his mouth off, and... Look at this. At the end of his life, he gets the sacraments. He was complaining about the guys we damn. It was like Jonah complaining about Nineveh. <laughs> well, 
I put it my way. I say, you that clean? <laughs> you that clean? You don't need redemption. You that clean? Probably said effing clean, okay? I find solace in the fact that God's finger, even for the people of Nineveh, for all of us who are estranged, that are just flesh and blood. See, I think of that one good act he took care of, that gift to Jake, but also took care of a woman who hated him. It's a great act. There was a movie, I think I told you all this already, the movie Akaton, Pierre Pasolini, where for one good act, this pimp, Akaton, that was his name, played by a pimp named Akaton, actually, true story. For one good act, he just didn't send a girl out. Not that he did anything, and he gets killed on the way home, okay? He's on his motorcycle. It's a, I know I told you the story, and then Pasolini quotes Dante. For one good act in the purgatory, one good act, you snatched him out of the palm of my hand. One good act by, <laughs> you see, the people of Nineveh, Nineveh, they hear the word of God and they respond to it. One good act, he redeems the whole city. See? One good act. Not a life of piety or innocence. One good act. I believe in that stuff. One of the greatest privileges of my life was to see redemption in the flesh, in the order, and the people people of the parish, especially the five, 50 years I've been associated with St. Timothy, St. Mark's. I've seen five generations. I've seen, I have seen that one good act. I'm glad if I was the instrument of responding to that one good act. I mean that. See? Jonah is a loser. Jonah is a loser. But even as a loser, he is an instrument of redemption. He's not innocent. God, he is anything but. But he's an instrument of grace to those who are also not innocent. The people in Nineveh are not innocent. They're in need of redemption. Even the animals got to do sack and cloth, uh, sackcloth and ashes. They fast, you see? Nobody's innocent. But they're all, they're all, as it were, I want to use the word worthy, and that's the wrong word. They are open to redemption. They have a heart open to see and to see the beauty, to see what Sarah's grandmother, to see the beauty. And the beauty here is the word of redemption preached by a very incompetent Jonah, a very sinful, selfish, stupid Jonah. But they heard that word and they responded to it. And that's the story of redemption. The story of Jonah is a consolation to those of us in the cloth, anybody. It's not innocence. Innocence has no cash value whatsoever. Zero. In fact, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's dangerous. I have to say, I, I, I see, some, I, well, the prayers at the church, often the colic prayer in the early, you know, in the daily mass, some of those prayers are God awful. They're pathetic. They're frightening. I remember one of them, one of them said something to the effect, we have called us back to our innocence. What? What innocence? What innocence? Whoever wrote that prayer is a dis I don't know what. I almost said despicable because you just face the face of Christ with a prayer like that. Return us to our innocence. He doesn't call us to innocence. He calls us to holiness through the sacrifice of the cross in which we share. It's an adventure into tomorrow, not a return to some phony state of unbelief, some simple state of innocence. Whoever wrote that prayer had to be a lawyer. Think in juridic terms, juridical terms, not in the dynamic of faith itself. I remember actually saying at the homily that day, this prayer is blasphemous. Only a lawyer could have written it. Not a person who actually believed in Christ. Only a lawyer, cheap ass lawyer. And I'm not talking about lawyers, I'm talking about canon lawyers who think that you can be returned to some innocent state by some juridic act. God help us. Yeah. I used to say about canon lawyers, I remember this line in the monastery. <laughs> we had great lines there. The, Pharise the canon law is the revenge of the Pharisees on the church. I don't know if that's true or not, but right now I feel it. And I'm shooting my mouth off, so I better quit before I really bury myself. But a lot of truth in what I just said. You're never called to innocence. You're called to holiness, and holiness is an adventure. 
Look at the life of St. Peter, Christmas trees. He got it wrong so often he was stumbling on himself. But by God, he's the rock upon which the church is built. It was his humility and his love of Christ as he stumbled along, going backwards when he should have been going forward, forward when he should have gone back. He is a model of belief because he's so human.